Dear Lord, help us to learn from your word and obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading today comes from Daniel 1, first eight verses. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of the staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. This is the word of God. Good morning, everyone. It's so special to come here and hear about the different gatherings in this place. Friendship service this week, soul sisters yesterday. You know, God, God is on the move. He's uh, building us up, shaping us, encouraging us, which is just wonderful. And isn't it so good to be part of a community that meets together on Sundays now, in the week? Yeah, praise the Lord for this time. Now, we have a series at the moment on different themes, like uh, topics. And today we're talking about culture shock or culture stress, stress, culture uh, stresses that uh, happen when two different uh, groups meet together and so this is the topic for today and I'll share start off with a bit about Indonesia and our experience but before I begin let's pray to the Lord to encourage us Lord we thank you so much that we can meet we thank you that you saved us thanks that we are one in Jesus and have the one Holy Spirit in our hearts we thank you that as we gather as soul sisters or friendship service or Sunday morning that you are here with us. Yeah, we pray, Father, that you work in our hearts now. Show us your ways, challenge us and build us up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2007, Paula and I and Ethan, three years old, Tyler, one year old, moved to Indonesia, which was a great adventure and journey. We were there for eight years and we had so much fun and we loved it and it was fantastic. But it also, the, we experienced culture stress and shock as we connected with the different places. And it was interesting to see what was going on in our hearts when we went through this. When, when there was a clash, like how, how we responded, how we felt and how that changed over those years. And so, yeah, different cultures that can bring shock, it can bring acceptance and challenge. And we see in this next slide, sometimes you've got two different people trying to talk to each other <laughs> with a big divide between them, <laughs> trying to connect, but so separate. And there's times we can feel so separate. And so for us on the journey, I must say in the first year or so, as we saw the differences between Indonesia and Australia, in my heart, it's sort of embarrassing to say, but I felt Australia is better. This, this is how I thought. You know, Australia is better, and I could give you a list of all these ways that I think that Australia is better, more efficient, the healthcare, the roads, all these different things. And so for a period of time, in my heart, there was sort of this 
sort of a pride and arrogance that would come up thinking Australia is superior. And so this would uh, grow in my heart. But then as, as time went on, as we get, got to know the community better, as we saw life from the inside in the Muslim village that we lived in, we saw the strengths of the Indonesian culture, how beautiful it is, how wonderful it is. We saw how they're so connected and relational, how they're community-minded, and we, we just love those things about that community. And there was a, a shift in our response where we thought, wow, Indonesia's better. And so we we'll, we'll think, you know, Indonesia is fantastic. The way they do these things, Indonesia is better. And when we come back to Australia, now at this time is when you hear about the angry missionaries who <laughs> come because you, you've been in another country, see the beauty, and then you come back and they're like, why do we do it this way? Yeah, we should do it this other way. And you have that experience. And then with some more time, then we could see the strengths and weaknesses in both places and see the beauty in each of those, those cultures. And so I must, must say for myself, like there was times of the, the pride in my heart and God was challenging that and the arrogance that I had about Australian culture being better. And uh, yeah, we also experienced the beauty of another place, which is fantastic. So we experienced culture stress, uh, culture shock when we arrived, reverse culture shock when we came back to Australia. But culture shock doesn't just happen when you're overseas, does it? It can happen, you know, in families as they connect together, two families joining together, two people with different cultural backgrounds and practices and ways of living meet together. I mean, you just think about the in-laws. I mean, they can be a strange bunch of people, can't they? The in-laws, well, the way they do things. And it's like the clash of two cultures as they meet together. Or it might be in a workplace. Someone moves from one department to another, that they've got a different culture, different way of operating, and they move to the next one, and that can be a clash and cause tension and trouble. And so we can see these things. It's not just, uh, yeah, new countries, but maybe we meet people from other cultures and backgrounds, and these can, yeah, cause a, a clash or a stress or a shock, and, yeah, different feelings arise. Now, when we see these clashes when two cultures meet it's a time to review it's a time to process the feelings inside of us like what practices and values will i take on which ones will i take on and which values will i leave behind and yeah not follow after well as christians on mission we see paul in the new testament what he does when he meets different cultures and we see this in 1 corinthians 9 verse 19 to 21. This is a bit of Paul's strategy and how he operated. It says this, Even though I'm free, with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed Jewish law, I lived under the law, even though I'm not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. So when he was with Jewish people, he acted like a Jewish person and changed to serve Jewish people. So we see Paul, he preaches in synagogues, he uses the Old Testament and quotes. You know, Timothy is also circumcised. That is, we might call that very hardcore cross-cultural <laughs> ministry there for, him, for them to change and connect with another culture. So he became like Jewish people to reach Jewish people. Now, when he met Gentiles, uh, people from non-Jewish backgrounds, verse 21 says, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. Some examples of that would be, yeah, he went to people's homes. He met uh, groups by the river where the people were meeting. He appealed to his Roman citizenship. He used quotes from poets and he did all these different things. It was an intentional strategy when he met new cultures to become like those people so he could serve them. Because there's so many barriers between different groups. There's so many walls between us and his plan was to remove the barriers, to put aside the unimportant things 
so he could tell them about Jesus. Or in his words, in verse 19, to bring many to Christ. This was his plan, wasn't it? To put those barriers to the side to walk together. In 1865, missionaries were in China. And in China at that time, the missionaries would go around and they wore full suits, ties. They ate English food as they spent their time there, which is interesting. And then this uh, man, Hudson Taylor, went and he started to change his lifestyle to be like Chinese people. So he aimed to be like them, to love the Chinese people and share the wonders of Jesus. So he learnt the Chinese language. He ate Chinese food. He grew like the long pigtail thing. And yeah, he adapted how he does things. And the other missionaries at the time wearing their suits were like, oh, why is he doing that? He shouldn't do that. But this, uh, this man, Hudson Taylor, he wanted to serve them. He wanted to be like them, to reach them, to tell them about Jesus. We'd say the greatest example of someone doing this is Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus comes from heaven. He leaves it all behind, changes to be like us as a human, to rescue us and give us life. When the two cultures of heaven and earth collided, Jesus changed to meet the other people, to meet us and to save us. And we do this in so many different ways where we adapt and change. We change different practices, like even in the church, change different practices. In the 12th century, educators wore robes. Wore robes when they taught, and same, the clergy in churches wore robes as they taught the word of God. And this was like the culture for so long, wearing robes uh, in university setting and in churches. Now, in the university, robes are just worn on graduation days with a nice hat, and, and uh, they get the robes out. But then the rest of the time wearing, you know, smart casual clothes would be, yeah, what people use. And so the same in the Anglican church, you know, at ordination services, people would get up and get all the robes on and get dressed up. But then in the everyday, we're wearing, you know, smart casual ordinary clothes and we change and we adapt to the time and the people that we're serving. So you want to follow the culture and connect with the people in the community and so this is just an example of robes or no robes, become like others to connect with them and to reach them. Now we do change and adapt to serve, but there are boundaries of what will change. When a practice goes against the teaching of the Bible, we want to stop at that point and reflect. And this is the call to Christians to live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Romans 12 verse 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So when we're saved by Jesus, we live this new life. We're new creations. We can follow after him. We live like heaven, not like earth. And it says, don't copy the behaviours and customs of this world. Be different. Be different to this world in how we love and share and express our walk with Jesus. There's a real call to be different and stand out as a saved person of God. Joan read out the story of Daniel. Daniel was part of the exiled people of Israel taken to Babylon. He had a special opportunity to learn in the courts of the king and the king trained them. He learned the language and the literature, verse 5. He joined in so many of their practices, but there was a point where he said no. 1 verse 8, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him by the king. 
So he did follow so many things, but then there was a point he said, stop, I won't follow that, and he held back. Later in the book, they were commanded to pray to no one except King Darius. When Daniel heard about this, chapter 6, verse 10, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down, as usual, in the upstairs room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. The call was, don't pray except to the king. He rejects that command and he prays to his Lord and he served his God. There was a point where he said, no, I won't follow without what's being said. I heard from an occupational therapist re, uh, recently, they were sharing a story about pressure that they're under uh, in that work, and particularly pressure to bend the rules of NDIS. So it's expected for all of them, oh, you're going to change your letter and make it look a certain way so that someone can get more than perhaps what they should. And so for this young uh, lady who's an OT, she wants to be fair and just, and she's in the job to help people, isn't she? But in the boundaries that there are. And so with all this pressure, the challenge for her is like, will I just follow, bow to this pressure or will I be different and, and work, work with honour in the place where I work? There's a call, be different. Be different as God's people as we are, follow after him. Now, sometimes it's hard to notice what is different. Sometimes it's hard to see what is different. See, when we grow up in a culture, we, we learn the ways of that culture. We think in that worldview. We operate in those ways. It's harder to review the culture that we grew up in. And so instead of being shocked by some of our culture you know, expressions, it's, it's possible that we are not shocked enough. It's possible that there's things going around us. We're not shocked enough by what we see. Let's think about TV and movies now, like all these themes, you know, revenge themes, themes, sexual immorality, taking advantage of the weak, gossip. These are all normal in the shows. And to see these, it's like, oh, yeah, they can be normal. But is it possible that we're not shocked enough? When we see these ways, they're not in line with God's ways. So may the holiness of God work in us so we can filter and we can evaluate what's happening in our culture. Now, sometimes we're not shocked enough. Sometimes we can be too shocked. We can see someone relate in a certain way and we can be offended. We can be over offended by what's happening. You know, sometimes the culture shock is not a godliness issue. You know, we might have feelings of, oh, that's wrong, that whatever, but maybe it's not wrong. Maybe it's not a godliness topic or a Bible topic. It's just Indonesians do it one way, Australians do it another way, and it's just different. And that's why we have this phrase, it's not wrong, it's just different, like culturally, it's just different. Sometimes we can be too shocked when we don't need to be. Or when we think about uh, people in the community who don't follow Jesus, we should not expect people who don't follow Jesus to act in Christian ways. Because... They're not Christians. We should not expect them. We should not be surprised. We should not be over-offended when we see people who don't follow Jesus not walking in Jesus' ways. And so there's times we're not shocked enough. Sometimes maybe we're too shocked when we shouldn't be. And when we see two cultures collide in the Bible, we've seen these two themes. They're actually opposites, aren't they? <laughs> One saying like, be like them, break down the barriers. The other one's saying, be different as God's people. So what do we do? How do we, how do we take these two things that are so, so different? Well, as we review our culture and the practices that we have, it's, I'm just going to give a few ideas how we could uh, go about this. First, we want to ask, how does it connect with Jesus' teaching? Is it a truth issue? Is it a holiness issue? And then want to ask, should we join in with it, reject it, or change it? So if we think about join in, maybe there's a practice in the culture and we just think, yeah, we can join in with this. It's not a godliness topic. 
want to be a part of it, celebrate it, join it. For other things, maybe, we want to reject it. We don't want to be a part of you. We want to be at that point like Daniel to say, oh, I want to be different in this situation. Or we can do another one. We can change it, give a new meaning to a practice or even create some other new practice that we do. Let me share an uh, example from Indonesia. It's called Tuju Bulanan. It's a seven-month baby shower. And at this seven-month baby shower, it's so fun. The whole, like for a few days beforehand, everyone's like making food and like gathering everything together. And it's a massive party in the village. Everyone gets together and you're all there. And some of the key elements of this, because they, they want to use these illustrations to symbolize a good labor. So what they do is they have live eels and they pour them over the head of the pregnant lady. Should we bring this in? Should we, should, we, should we make this a part of things? We've got, we've got to talk to some of these uh, new future parents <laughs> at church. They pour live eels over the head to symbolise, you know, a smooth uh, labour <laughs> that's going to go really well. And they, they also do things like they have prayers from the imam and they have surahs from the Quran. They also use garlic in the ceremony to ward off evil spirits. And so we're at this massive party, we look at this, what do we think about this practice? Do we want to join in? Like Paula's pregnant later, like, should she do this? Should we be a part of this? And this is a good one to ask. How does it connect or overlap with the teaching of Jesus? Should we join in, reject it, or change it? These are the questions that we had, and we, we have these about lots of topics. Now, parts of this are good. Communities are gathering together. It's a celebration of life and the God giving, you know, preg a, a baby and good things. Or should we reject it? Other parts are not in line with the Bible. There's a lot of fear of evil spirits going on in the ceremony. There's uh, parts of the Quran being read out. Now, for us, as we looked at this, the challenge is, in the culture they've been doing this for so long... If it's rejected, there's sort of nothing that shows how Christians should do that pregnancy and birth. So how do we express how Christians go about their trust in God during the stress of labour and birth? And so this is what we did. We took the neutral practices. Paula did do the eels getting pulled o poured over her head <laughs> to, to, to symbolise, you know, a safe and good uh, smooth labor so she, she did that part we did reject the verses from the quran we rejected the animistic elements and we replaced them with new meaning so we use bible verses about god knitting together children we use verses like that we prayed in the name of jesus so we saw that tradition this practice that's gone on for so long and we changed that tradition and we adapted it to put jesus at the center and so for us as God's people, we want to be doing this about all the different practices that we see in Australia and around the world. We want to hold, we want to review what is happening and ask these questions. And there could be like activities that go on. It's like retirement. You know, how do Australians do retirement? How do Christians do a retirement? So it's a good question, isn't it? And we review, are we joining in with this? Are we rejecting certain elements are we changing it as God's people could be like how do you do dinner time how do you do holidays or it might be values or attitudes you know what's our relationship to personal comfort and happiness or instant gratification or how we value time or relationship and so in all different areas we can look at so we do this thing why do we do it that way and what is the Christian way that we could do those things. So I encourage you this week, just think about what are the things I'm doing? Why, why is that? Where is it from? And just to pause and say, I want to review this. I want to review it. It could be the big events of our society. It could be everyday practices. Why do we do it the way that we do it? Now today, this is a very short introduction into culture shock, stress, and how we respond so we do have culture clashes. It's real in the Australian setting, families, workplaces. 
and it's real when we connect with people from different cultures and different places, uh, that this is normal. And from my experience moving to Indonesia, in our hearts, we, sometimes we didn't respond well. Sometimes I was quite arrogant in how I responded. There was blind spots. Then other times there was great celebration and thankfulness, like as I think about myself. Now, when we see these clashes, we need wisdom from God, and this will be, we need, we need him to guide us, don't we? Whether it's a time where we, we should be like others to connect with them or be different as God's people. So I'm just going to finish off with this idea. As we go about this, as we seek the Lord, seek wisdom from God, let's be gracious uh, in, in our responses. For culture clashes that are not about holiness and the Bible, let's walk slowly and in grace. That's what we want to do. And for other topics that are about holiness and biblical truth, let's walk slowly and in grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who left heaven and changed to become like us to save us. We thank you for his example. Thank you for his humility and his grace. And Lord, we pray in the culture clashes that we experience, that we have in the past, in the future, strengthen us to walk humbly and respond in grace, Lord. And Lord, we do pray that you'll guide us whether we're meant to join in or reject or change different practices. Yeah, Lord, we really need your help. So we pray for your guidance and wisdom. You know, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.